So good evening. Um, thank you for joining this uh, 2020 Futures panel. Uh, my name is Jay Kaufman. I'm a graduate of Town Meeting and a graduate of the State Legislature and uh, recently launched a nonprofit organization to do leadership development for people who, in public life, having noticed some considerable room for improvement in that, in that regard. The um, history of this Futures panel really goes back to the early 90s when a group of us in town meeting noticed that many of the day-to-day -day and year-to-year -year decisions we were making really needed a broader context, a uh, broader, ge broader geographic contract context, broader temporal context. We needed to have a sense of what the demographics of the town were, were, were going to be like 20 years out. Who was gonna live here? Who was moving in? What are the economic circumstances that we face, not just here in Lexington, but across the state, across the country and around the world? What are the changes in public services that we should be cognizant of? And what should we be anticipating as we try to shape uh, this community of which we love and share? So thus was born Lexington 2020. At the time, uh, 2020 looked like a quite a long ways off. We were officially launched in 1998. And 2020 was really on the distant horizon. But we were a little bit naive in thinking that you can look to the future with 2020 vision, with perfect vision. It's not clear to me that we, we can even look to the past with 2020 vision, and we certainly can't uh, look to the future. And if you need any proof of that, just you should know that much of what we had planned to do this evening has gone out the window because of uh, the changed circumstances because of COVID-19. It's either false or irrelevant. So, so much for planning for the future. Uh, it's an imperfect, imperfect art. That said, it's an important undertaking, an important exercise. And from the very beginning, uh, this Lexington Futures, Lexington 2020 committee has been committed to public engagement. And tonight is no exception. So we are counting on you uh, for your questions and your comments uh, so that we can look ahead 20 years and make some, give some guidance to those who will, will be making decisions for us and for our future or the future of our um, I just want to particularly acknowledge a few people. Uh, Rick White was the town manager at the time we launched this. Uh, his successor, Carl Valenti, uh, joined in on the effort um, and their longtime town manager's assistant, Candy McLaughlin. All three of them were absolutely critical in grounding us uh, in the process and making sure that it informed the decision-making in Lexington. So their vision uh, and their diligence and commitment really has made a big difference. Let me pause for a moment and introduce Mark Manassas, who's gonna walk us through a little bit about the technology that we're working with here this evening. Uh, for those of you who are new to Zoom, uh, you will get an excellent primer on it shortly. You should also know that although I've used it somewhat in the past, and I'm used to public speaking. I'm not used to public speaking in the privacy of my dining room and looking at this little green dot that's on my computer. So this is an experiment for all of us, but Mark, help us out. Great, um, thank you very much, Jake. Good evening, everyone. And uh, on behalf of the 2020 um, Vision Committee, welcome to the panel this evening. Very excited to hear from our distinguished guests. Um, Two weeks ago, it seemed like this was an imperative. We need to do a Zoom primer. People aren't gonna know how to use it today. Perhaps not so much. I'm sure a lot of people have spent a lot more time than they wish to acknowledge on uh, Zoom. That being said, uh, if you can't hear anything, hopefully you're not sitting out there wondering what's going on, but if you can't hear anything and you're on a PC, look in the lower left corner of your screen and you might try changing your speakers. Um, there might be several ones listed, try changing it. And of course, check your volume. Try changing your system volume. Uh, if you're on your iPhone or your Android, same thing if you can't hear your audio, you might uh, take a look at the top left of your screen and find a speaker. Uh, make sure it doesn't have an X through it. Um, the last thing I'll say is, um, the video, you probably have the option to see it as a single person speaking or multiple people speaking. And if you look in the top right hand corner of your screen, you'll see an option to toggle between gallery view and speaker view. Um, you don't, I believe, have this option on a uh, iPhone or an Android. 
and it's going to look slightly different on a Chromebook or some other platforms. The last thing I'm going to say, and then we'll we'll turn it back over to Jay and the panelists, is uh, well, two last things. One, um, Q and A. If you we're going to use the Q and A function um, tonight, so you look for the Q and A function when you mouse over your screen on either your PC or your Android. We will not be monitoring the chat. In fact, I believe it's disabled uh, because of the, some of the incidences of Zoom bombing that people may have heard about. Um, so do that. And the last thing I'd like to say is thank you to people like um, Sean Dugan, Kathleen Lebrac, um, Dr. Hackett, who don't work in Lexington, but really do uh, uh, above and beyond to help us through these sort of challenging times. So thank you very much and back to you, Jay. Thank you, Mark, and thank you for helping set this up and, and train us in its use. Um, so while our panelists are going to bring a tremendous amount of experience and expertise to us, I want to emphasize the function, the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. We're counting on, on your engagement with us uh, this evening. So um, thank you in advance for your questions and your comments. I will try to, we will all try to monitor them and get to them as many as we can. So first I'm gonna ask the panelists to help us launch the conversation. And let me turn first to you, uh, Nariman Beravesh, Dr. Beravesh, uh, Chief Economist for HIS Market, a global consulting firm that, although tonight is dealing with those of us in Lexington, normally deals with governments and businesses around the globe. Um, and I know for, for a fact that you have been dealing in risk analysis for most of your adult life. Um, so you are as primed for this moment as any of us possibly are. And I also know that a lot of what you had hoped to be able to address tonight is out the window because of changed circumstances. So where are we? What can you tell us about thank today, you, Jay. mainly about the future? <laughs> yes, thank you, Jay. I'll try to focus on the future, but I'll, and I can't avoid talking about the current situation a little bit in terms of the next couple of years, but I'll do that. And then look at some long-term trends and in that context, bring in, some of the slides I was going to show, not, not show the slides, but discuss you know, some of the trends I was going to show vis-a-vis -vis Lexington, but then maybe speculate a little bit, and this gets into uh, what Dan and, and Julie maybe are going to say about some possible long-term ramifications of this, because it does have long-term ramifications. But first, in terms of the outlook over the next couple of years, this is a very unusual situation, as we all know, um, in our personal lives, but in terms of the economy. Just to quote a couple of things, we're looking at uh, lockdowns of about one third of the population of the world, huge. We're talking about what's referred to as sudden stops in uh, activity in many service sectors. Um, so just to give you one example, airline traffic is 5%, 5% of what it was a year ago. Um, so that, you know, th those kinds of things have a huge impact. Um, uh, and on and on. I mean, I could, I could go and, and, and give you all the, all the other numbers. And unemployment rates rising. I mean, today we saw 6.6 uh, 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 6 million initial claims for unemployment. That's like 15 times uh, the prior record. I mean, the prior record was a week ago, but beyond that, it was like 15 times higher. So these are, super, I mean, superlatives in a bad sense, let's be honest. So what does all this mean? Well, to, to do any kind of reasonable forecast, for the path of the US economy or the world economy, we have to make some assumptions about the path of the disease. And up until recently, a lot of the studies we saw suggested that this thing would peak around July, August. So the forecast I'm gonna give you makes that assumption, but recently we've seen some studies from the CDC and University, University of Washington suggest it could peak sooner. Uh, so instead of July, August, it may be May in which case the numbers I'm about to give you may be too negative. So, so let's, let's just kind of say that up front. Um, but there's a huge amount of uncertainty. And we're not, I'm not an epidemiologist. I keep, you know, I keep uh, mis, not mispronouncing, stumbling over that word. But anyway, um, the point is we rely on the experts, you know, Dr. Fauci, you know, the University of Washington, CDC, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so a lot of people are, are kind of complaining to us about why are you making this assumption about the disease? Why are you making that assumption about the disease? Well, you know, it's, we're going with what the experts say. But that said, 
assuming a July-August peak, we're looking at a horrific economic outlook, the worst basically since the 1930s. We said that in the 2008-2009 financial crisis. We thought that was, that was it. Well, this is even worse than that, by the way. So on an annual basis, we're looking at GDP in 2020 dropping by 5.4%. That's a record, basically, since the 30s. And then coming back to growth of between 4 and 5% in 2021. But um, the second quarter number, which is where it's really going to hit the U.S., is going to be a horrific 25% annualized drop in real GDP. We haven't seen anything like this ever. So I just want to be clear, this is bad. But the real question becomes not so much how bad is it in terms of the recession, it'll be bad, unemployment rate probably hitting 10%. But what happens next? What's, what happens on the other side of this valley, as it were? What happens in terms of the recovery? And those of you who, who sort of look at this literature and, and articles and stuff are aware of the fact that people are talking about V-shaped recoveries, U-shaped recoveries, L-shaped recoveries, W-shaped recoveries. But very quickly, I'll go through that. In manufacturing, we probably will get a V-shaped recovery because that's the way things happen in manufacturing. Once you get past the sort of a big inventory buildup, which we're seeing right now, we'll probably see manufacturing come popping back. But what's different about this recession and this cycle is it's concentrated in services. Services typically do not go into a recession or if they do, it's a very mild recession. In this case, the deepest recessions will be in services. And here, the recoveries are probably gonna be U-shaped for a couple of reasons that I'll articulate. Number one, let me just, I'll, you know, just say, it's gonna take people a long time to go back to situations and activities where they have to be with a lot of other people. Just to kind of put a benchmark here, after 9-11, it took airline traffic two and a half years to get back to the pre-attack levels. It's going to take at least as long as that. A colleague of mine has made this point. After 9-11, when you got an airplane, they might be a terrorist on your plane, but thousands of flights in the U.S. each day, chances of a terrorist being on your plane, pretty low. This time around, say September, October, chances of somebody with COVID being on your plane is a lot higher. So a lot of people are going to be very reluctant to fly, very reluctant to go to sports games, very reluctant to go to bars. So this comeback in services will be slow. Another point to be made is that households and businesses are taking huge financial hits because of the stock market, but also because debt levels are rising in the corporate sector and in household sector. People like, you know, they, they're paying a lot of bills with credit cards because they don't have a choice. So working off that worsened financial situation, trying to get out of that whole financial hole, means that a lot of households, a lot of businesses are going to spend much more slowly this time around than they did before. So what does all this mean? It means it's going to pay, take us about two to three years to get back to the level of economic activity that we had in um, 2000 basically the beginning of 2020. Uh, and the unemployment rate, which goes up to, we think, to about 10%, will take that long to come back down to where it is right now, four or 5%. You know, it's actually three and a, it was at three and a half. So say three years to be conservative. So that's what we're looking at. Very sharp downturn, slow recovery. Now, just let me say this. Um, in the 2008, 2009, um, recession. I remember going to a party um, in somebody's backyard on Merriam Hill, and uh, somebody said to me about the, the financial crisis, is this the end? And I said, no, this too shall pass. And this will pass. The problem is, you know, between now and the passing, as it were, it's not going to be fun. We know that. But our best guess is we'll start to see the light at the end of the tunnel maybe as early as the third quarter, but certainly by the fourth quarter. So take heart, there is an end to this thing. Now, a few words about long-term trends and Lexington. The good news is the Lexington typically 
does a number of things better, not better, but you know, higher than the national average, higher than the Massachusetts average. So our income, basically disposable income, take home pay, whatever you want to go, family income, typically just under two and a half times that of uh, Massachusetts. And that gap has continued over the last 20 years. I don't see any reason that that's going to change. So we'll be, we'll be hurt, no question. But the, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll do better than most. So in that sense, I think we have to sort of think about what is it we do well and continue to do it. And education, which we'll talk about in a few minutes, is one of them. Another, of course, is housing and house prices. And here in the past recessions, there have been small dips in terms of house prices, and then it's come back. So Lexington has done much better than many towns uh, around here, not all of them. You know, obviously, there are some other towns that have done well. But Lexington has done you know, pretty well. And I don't see any reason that that's going to change. One trend that's worth mentioning, because I think of it as a very positive trend, and I'll, I'll draw out the implications, is that the Asian population in this town has gone from about 10% to about 30% in the last uh, 10, 20 years or so. I view that as a very, very positive development in the sense that Asian families put, put a huge premium and a huge value in education. And the, one of the reasons they're coming to Lexington is because our educational system is so good. And we have to keep nurturing that. To me, that's a really very positive trend for this town, but it, again, it has huge implications for, uh, for investing, when I have to say it this way, in education. We can't, despite all the problems we're gonna have in terms of funding, we can't really do serious damage to that. We can't. This is, this is one of the things we do well and should continue to do well. Just a few words about long-term implications here. Um, not just for Lexington, but, but you know, all told. This, this crisis, as most crises do, will have profound effects on, on a number of things. And I'm here, I'm gonna speculate a little bit. I don't, there's a long list. I'm not gonna go through all of it, but, but clearly one thing that's very clear is that online activity of all kinds has taken off. I mean, we talked about Zoom, yes, but it's in terms of retail, um, in terms of the role that Amazon plays, obviously. Uh, in terms of education, we'll hear more about that entertainment and work. Um, you know, I, I've heard from a number of companies that say, you know, I'm happy to, to get rid of all this office space that I'm stuck with. You know, I'm happy to have my workers work at home, especially the knowledge workers, obviously. Now there's a downside in the sense that th there's a lot of value in the social interactions. There's a lot of intellectual value in being close to other people. But I'm, I'm hearing more and more companies saying, eh, you know, this is a great excuse for me to consolidate. So we'll see. Um, other things to kind of keep in mind is the process of globalization hasn't stopped, but it's changing. So we're not going to trade so much goods as we are data. I mean, give you one example, you know, data and copyrights will be traded so that you, if you're manufacturing something, can use that data and copyrights to use that 3D printer in your home or your uh, facility to build something which you were importing before or importing components of before. Um, uh, so that, that's, another, that's another big change that's gonna happen. So we're gonna see a shortening of supply chains uh, you know, pretty much across the world. Uh, and one more thing I'll just mention very quickly. Uh, again, this is far from exhaustive list. Reallocation of labor. Yes, indeed, their you know, entertainment is losing business, or losing workers, airlines are losing anything, hotels and so on. But look at where, where we're seeing gains, obviously in hospitals, they're crying for help. Um, grocery stores, they're crying for help. All you have to do is go to the local uh, Whole Foods. So already we're seeing the shift, big shift in the, in the US labor force. Whether that's permanent or temporary, it's a little hard to tell. I'm guessing some of it's permanent. So I think you know, these are the kinds of things we look at and say, okay, how's the landscape gonna be different? five years, 10 years from now. Um, we'll be there. This is, you know, again, to leave on an upbeat note, the U.S. economy is very resilient. We've already figured a lot of stuff out. We still have stuff to figure out, no question. And there've been a lot of mistakes made at the national level. I'm not gonna belabor that point. But we're very resilient people, very resilient economy. So I have a lot of faith we'll get through this and come out the other end in pretty good shape. So thank you, Jay.
Thank you, Naomi. Just one question came across uh, that I will throw out to you, although I think the answer is pretty straightforward. Uh, since you were talking about uh, recovery in a couple of years, uh, does it really make a lot of difference whether we start bouncing back in May or in June or July? I, mean, I think the answer is it doesn't make that yes. much difference. Right. Well, it doesn't, but it, I mean, it, if, if this recession drags on, let's say through the end of the year into next year, that's a very bad scenario. Yeah. So, I mean, yes, we, we can't prevent, even with a $2 trillion package, uh, the recession being very deep. We can't prevent this. It's too late. We should have done that, you know, in February. Um, but we can prevent it from being much deeper than I've described. But hopefully we can also uh, help the recovery. In other words, keep the recovery going. The key here to me is helping small businesses, I think, because what you want to do is make sure that they're not forced into laying off a lot of people because then that has a cascading effect. So this particular $2 trillion package didn't have enough for small businesses, but I hear that there's talk in Congress of coming back and doing more for small businesses. That would be very good. Great, thank you. And thank you in particular for zeroing in on some of the implications for those of us in Lexington. And I think we'll come back to that. And I also would like the other panelists to come at, after the next two presentations, I'd like to come back to some of the broader trends um, and some of the opportunities uh, inherent in this crisis because they, they are plentiful. Um, next, I'm gonna to turn to Dr. Julie Hackett. Uh, Julie is uh, superintendent of schools here in Lexington and um, in the enviable, unenviable position of having her school system closed um, and needing to reinvent it. Um, on the fly. So, Julie, what's, uh, what's on your mind and what's in your crystal ball? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So that's on my mind, how to operate the technology in a way that people can <laughs> um, be on the receiving end. Um, so, uh, obviously, a lot has happened, like the previous speaker, it's hard to talk about the future without talking about the present. And even in my case, maybe a little bit about the past. And I think to situate and um, put into context the remarks that I wanna make, I wanna start with a, a conversation about um, something that I read probably 30 years ago during graduate studies, close to 30 years ago, um, and it, is um, it was a book by Tayak and Cuban, and it is about um, the grammar of schooling. And it, the title of the book was Tinkering Towards Utopia. Um, and the grammar of schooling is important in the context of future discussions because um, it talks about how impenetrable change can be in educational institutions. And I think we do have a fantastic educational system in Lexington with the potential to get even better. And I too admire um, the work that the system's been able to do. And I love and appreciate the diversity in our system and can see a lot of promise in things that we're able to accomplish. But I wanted to start with a discussion about the grammar of schooling because um, what it suggests is that schools are very, very hard to change. And anytime reform is introduced, um, it's met with this uh, ritualized notion that has existed for hundreds of years um, and this kind of tendency to bring us back to business as usual. And I think it's um, first and foremost in my mind because um, we had to basically overnight reinvent ourselves, as, as you said, Jay. Um, we, we announced the school closure, a two-week school, school closure before the governor announced the closure due to COVID-19. And um, then we had to uh, determine how we were going to, de to deliver educational services. And what we did in Lexington was a little different. And I'll talk a little bit about how um, it's been a learning experience, I think, for the entire community and how that change is hard to come about. And then the promise of the change in educational trends that we'll see. But when we announced the closure of the school, um, by day two, even by day one in some cases, we had a number of people saying, where's the educational plan? I want online learning and I want it right now. And we were still trying to figure out how are we gonna utilize all of our professionals? Will people get pay? 
How do we engage people in the work in a remote setting? How do we take into account student needs and differences and provide them the support that they need in a way that makes sense? And there were basically the reinvention of every system imaginable in education had to be thought about. And what we didn't want to do is go quickly into that discussion, um, knowing how hard it is to take back an implementation that's gone wrong or done poorly. So we said, we're going to take a few days to figure this out. But right now, imagine that it's a snow day. And I always say it's the snow day, like the, the ones I had in Maine, where no one went anywhere. <laughs> you stayed home, you stayed with your family, you didn't go to parties, that kind of thing. So we said, we're going to take some time and we're just going to figure this out. And um, obviously, education is really important, and it's very, very important in Lexington. And people were anxious and nervous about what the future would hold. Um, and we took a little bit of time to figure that out. Six days to be exact, we rolled out a, a remote learning plan. And one of the interesting things about Lexington is, um, as I've encountered complex problems in my two years, um, there are extreme variations in opinion, and that comes from um, lots of differences culturally, lots of um, you know, people who are very knowledgeable about different subjects. And the, the variation swings to extremes. So some people wanted um, a, an online learning system that replicated the school day. You log on in the morning, you work through a sequence of courses, and you log off at night. And then other people wanted something completely different and a bit more responsive to this changing world in the pandemic. And so we le learned and listened from other districts and developed a remote learning plan. Um, the remote learning plan is unlike anything that we've done in the school system. It actually interestingly aligns with the strategic plan that we just developed. Um, our mission is joy in learning, curiosity in life, and compassion in all we do. We have core values that uh, include things like um, failure is an important part of learning. We should get comfortable with it. It's okay if everything's not perfect. Um, core values around being curious and using your mind, doing your part, being empathetic, and, and words like that that capture the spirit of the kind of thinker and the kind of learner that we need right now, particularly in the situation that we're dealing with. The disconnect was that the strategic plan that we have and the um, conditions that were being placed upon us due to the virus um, were, were um, we just weren't used to kind of practicing those values and putting those words into action in, in a way that we have had to do in the last two weeks. And so what we said was we were not going to grade. So, I mean, this is, this is a very different world that we're in because um, people everywhere and especially people in Lexington are used to grades and we said we're going to give you feedback on your learning. So that's a departure for teachers. Um, we asked teachers to work in teams collaboratively and in it interdisciplinary ways. So you'd work across subjects, content, uh, content and disciplines. And that isn't typical, particularly at the high school levels. Um, so the demands being placed on the learners and the staff were very different. And the reason those demands were put into place through the remote learning plan is so that people would have an understanding of the needs of each other. We would be working through issues in the community. If staff members get sick, people are there to fill in if you're working with a team and so on. Um, and the point I want to make with this is that those changes, um, if we were just to implement them without what we've gone through with the pandemic would have been extremely hard to put through, um, even in, in small doses. And so I've reflected a lot on the, the grammar of schooling and the tendency for schools to kind of dig in as an institution and maintain what we have and have always done. And um, when we think about the future and we think about future educational trends, I think there's a lot for us to learn and to think about and, and to consider um, what we'll see in the future, for example. Do you want me to go with, into this now, Jay, or do you want me to stop and save that for the next part? Um, no, I'd love you to do that, because I, okay. I remember reading Tinkering Toward Utopia some years ago, and I want to hear about what, I want to hear what utopia looks like now. I know. Okay, so that's a great segue. Well, I will try to define it for you. Um, so I, I think utopia, um, to me, is a lot like um, 
what Seymour Papert talked about um, many years ago. I had the good fortune of being on the Maine Learning Technology Initiative, which was Governor Angus King's one-to-one -one laptop initiative. At the time, it was the first in the world. Seymour Papert was on the same task force. I was a young middle school principal, and that was where the rollout was, was starting. So um, I anticipated that we'd talk a lot about educational technology. We didn't. Uh, Seymour Papert, MIT um, professor, um, you know, he was in artificial intelligence, and I'm sure many people have heard of him, was at the table, and he talked all the time about learning. So it always struck me that the educational technology portion was not part of the conversation more prominently. But what he talked about is that children and people need to learn and to build together through this construct constructionist theory of learning, and that you know, when you're able to create and build and construct, you make a difference in the world and you get more engaged and that's the real secret and key to learning. So even though that, that was in the past as well, um, some years ago, I think that uh, learning theory holds great promise for the future. I think we will see our young people um, as a result of the necessity of what we're experiencing, we will see young people needing to be much more cognitively flexible. We will see young people um, and schools adapting to be able to produce or to um, cultivate um, this adaptability in our young people. More creativity and engagement. Um, Project-based learning is talked about a lot. Um, and, you know, in some respects, we pay some lip service to it, but project-based learning that changes the community, I think you'll see a lot more of. Um, as one example, we have young people um, in our own school system at the high school level right now uh, who are making masks for healthcare workers on 3D printers. Um, no one told them to do that. We said, you have some time, there's some flexibility. Um, you know, do, do what you think is exciting and important. And they, they work together, they collaborated, and they are making masks that they're going to be able to deliver to others. And our teachers donated um, machinery from, from the schools that they could use and filament um, that they couldn't get their hands on. And they're building and creating and, and, and uh, developing a solution that's needed right now. So project, projects like that, I think, will become more at the center of the work. Um, I know people are talking about chatbots and artificial intelligence and things like that. I think there's um, some promise and interest in, in that area. Um, I did read a study, um, it was out of Spain, where they were introducing chatbots um, basically to deal with their inefficiencies in their institutions, post-secondary institutions. And what they acknowledged was that they weren't able to uh, meet the needs of students and answer questions. They didn't have the staffing, they didn't have the capacity. And so they developed these chatbots to be able to do that. And they found that in this particular study, there, there was a 91% success, success rate with the chatbots. Um, and I think that's, a, that's an interesting thought. As we're working on our remote learning now, we're faced with questions like, um, how do we provide therapies to students who used to get them with um, a therapist in the school setting, speech therapists, occupational therapists, physical therapists, because you can't have um, the one-to-one -one contact that you had in the school system before. So I think we're going to see um, out of necessity, uh, more teletherapies being developed, people being able to connect um, and meet needs we haven't met before. Everyone in education knows that we have a terrible shortage of um, mental health care professionals to support young people in the later teen years and, and uh, into their early adulthood. And so perhaps those types of um, educational technologies can can fill the, fill the need. I don't think they'll ever take the place of a person and the human contact that's required um, to help people through tough times, but in the absence of uh, basically no other support, um, they, may, they may be able to fill a need in the, in the system. So I have, I have great hope for the future and for education. I am thinking now about, you know, how do we as a school system capture what we've learned? We've learned every system differently. We work differently every day. Um, my day starts with, you know, reaching out to different teams and just having one of those talks. It reminds me of 
when what you see in a hotel when they all get together with a chef and they all say okay let's get in the huddle or the coach and then you go out and you start your day and it's been um, incredibly anchoring uh, and it, it builds a sense of community even though we're far apart um, so I think that some of those practices in the future could could continue I also think that um, this strong need to connect as human beings will be at the forefront of everything that we do and um, that we will be much more collaborative, we'll understand how much we need each other more and we'll be able to work um, better in teams. I can say more, but I'll, I'll stop there for now. Great, Julie, let me know, let you know one of the comments that came across the screen just now is, could you tell Dr. Hackett that for what it's worth, I think it's amazing that the program they have implemented as fast as they did, it's from Avram. So for him and for, for me, uh, thank you for doing that. And thank you also for seeing the opportunity in this crisis. Um, and I know that schools are hard to change. Communities are hard to change. People are hard to change. And um, maybe, just maybe, the history of COVID-19 will include the opening uh, for, that kind of, for the kind of change that you're talking about. So we'll come back to some of that, um, Anon. Any last thoughts before I turn it over to Dan? Was that to me, Jay? Yes, yes. Oh, oh. <laughs> no, nope, I think you captured it. Thank okay. you. So Dr. Dan O'Brien is Associate Professor of Policy at Northeastern University and directs uh, Northeastern's Boston Area Research Initiative. Uh, Dan, what does our community look like going forward? Sure, sure. So let me share my screen. Um, so I am, at least for now, not going to talk about COVID-19. Um, I don't know if that's tone deaf or a welcome break, uh, but I'm going to stick with it. Uh, and then, but I will double back um, to where we are now, because uh, I guess that's kind of inevitable at the moment. Um, but also, I think there's something to be said here. But I, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm on the paddle in some sense as the futurist, not normally my role, but, uh, but I, do, I do do work. Uh, my research really sits at this intersection of, well, what some people call smart cities. And if we were all sitting in a room together, I would ask you all what that term means to you um, and uh, probably take a few thoughts. And, you know, people will probably provide quite a few different opinions. But, but what I want to kind of present, for starters at least, not on the slide, there we go, um, is a, a, lot of the, a lot of the smart cities tropes that we hear um, so-called transforming cities, transforming communities in the coming years, things like um, autonomous vehicles, right? Ubiquitous sensing or putting sensors on every street corner, which will tell you what's happening everywhere, right? What is the temperature? What's the light? What's the sound? What's the pollution level? So on and so forth. Um, these uh, Link NYC kiosks uh, that are in New York City and now London, and Toronto, um, they're basically like the public payphone for the 21st century, right? Uh, put a tablet out there, a USB charger, um, a Wi-Fi hotspot, so on and so forth. Um, actually, literally in New York City, in place of where all of the public payphones used to be. Um, or for those of you who remember this movie from the 1990s, um, Minority Report, uh, predictive analytics, right? Can we predict where the next crime is going to occur, the next fire? Can we anticipate events analytically and then respond to them before they happen or, or try to prevent them in some way? And, and that same logic is being applied all over the place um, in schools, right? See if you can look at the data and identify a student who's struggling or um, with uh, actually child abuse hotlines, right? Uh, child abuse hotlines get uh, tons more calls than they can possibly respond to. And so there's been some experiments with using um, administrative data to triage cases uh, to determine which ones are most at risk, right? So these are the stories that we hear about smart cities and, and kind of this 21st century or really Asimovian or Jetsonian sort of sense of the future, right? Where everything's going to be different. Um, and, and those stories are nice, right? They're, they're fine. Um, but, but I think that they have some real discontents to them, right? It's a little bit like an Isaac Asimov novel. It's a little bit like uh, a puff piece in Wired more than it is exactly reality, or at least exactly the reality that we need as cities and communities. And, and so I want to raise three. So the first one is a lot of these innovations were developed with the approach technology is the answer. What was the question? 
Right. What are we trying to do with these flashy, shiny things that we figured out how to build? Right. Um, in a lot of cases, it was shoot first, aim later. Right. It impressed people that something cool was made. Um, but like I've talked to people from companies who want to put sensors on every uh, street pole in a city and they can't always really tell you what that's going to be good for. They just tell you that there's a lot of information there and that it could be good for something. Um, are we addressing the real needs of communities, right? So the follow-up on that is not only are we serving a particular need, but did we even figure out in advance what that need is? Um, and now I do a lot of my work in the city of Boston. So I often kind of pose like, did anyone ask the people of Mattapan if they need autonomous vehicles uh, or ubiquitous sensing? But you know, for, for this case as well, right? What do the people of Lexington need? What are the challenges that are actually being faced by the community that could be benefited by technology um, or not, right? And defining those things um, and, and approaching it from that direction and then figuring out what the technology can do to serve. Um, and then we do have this big concern, and, and this is probably a, a trope or, or an angle that I'm, I'm going to address a lot this evening, which is, are we seeing a new emerging digital divide, right? We talk about digital divide typically in terms of um, the rich and the poor and access to things like computers, uh, smartphones, internet, so on and so forth. Uh, but a digital divide is anywhere where there's a line between the people who have a certain technology and the people who don't. And at the end of the day, right, between have and have not communities or really industries and sectors, right? So. A lot of times, and, and Lexington is probably lucky in this regards, uh, Lexington, I live in Arlington, and I'm literally about 100 feet from Lexington uh, right now. Um, you know, these communities just north of the city, a, a lot of our population works in tech at some level or another. We're, we're at the table um, and able to contribute to these conversations. We have the expertise to deal with data and technology. And there are a lot of communities, though, where they don't have that expertise. They're not invited to the table. They are not part of the solution building. Um, but the other one is between can and can't afford cities um, and really cities and towns. You know, um, Boston has a lot of spare uh a lot of spare horsepower because it's big, right? Same thing with New York, same thing with Washington DC or Seattle or San Francisco, right? As you have a larger and larger organization, as it were, you have a greater capacity to continue innovating and continue building because you have those resources. Um, you have that greater potential to build out personnel um, for those pur purposes and to invest in, in infrastructure, right? That's why towns agglomerated into cities in the first place um, to make utilities more affordable, uh, so on and so forth. Um, and, and so then the question is, are smart cities technologies, are these technologies of the future for cities and communities, are they exclusive to metropolises, metropolises, sorry, um, metropolises, or, or is there some way that the Bostons, the New Yorks, the Washington DCs can can lead the way, fine, but then transfer the, that knowledge, that technology um, to smaller municipalities to help them um, use them. Uh, and again, right, what could Lexington do that Boston has already figured out? And further, how do we, how do we transfer that information in a way that is appropriate for the receiving town? The, the, the shoe that fits Boston is not the shoe that fits Lexington necessarily. For, for some of these innovations and, and ideas. And so, you know, how do, we, how do we support that transfer and that conversation in a way that doesn't feel sort of superimposed or imperialistic on the part of the metropolis? Um, so th that kind of brings me to this question, right? What does it mean for a city to be smart? And, and this is a very academic way of dealing with, with a, a, a popular um, buzzword, um, but, Right? If you're going to say a city is smart or a community is smart, what does that mean? And, you know, I found myself uh, reflecting on, well, what do I think of a smart person, right? Well, a smart person is not a technology, right? They might use technology, might be good with computers, uh, and they know when to use the technologies that they have available to them, but that's not all that constitutes a smart person, right? A smart person is someone who can gather information, who can bring it together, um, can synthesize it, can ask interesting questions, can come up with creative solutions. And if we think about the smart and connected communities of the future, of 
five, 10, 20 years from now, what, what the opportunity here is, is to do just that, to be smart with the tools that are available. Um, so I, I want to make the argument here that this is available to everyone at some level, and it might not be autonomous vehicles, right? Uh, you know, autonomous vehicles are only being tested in places that are either very rich or very dry right now, um, because those are the places where it's easier to test them uh, and their machine learning algorithms, but that there are other things that we can be doing and to be setting our sights appropriately for what being smart is. And I call this transformation in the mundane. It's basically this idea that naturally occurring data is out there and it's everywhere, right? So this is, uh, ironically, uh, it's not actually data from Lexington, but it has the word Lexington all over it. Um, this is a picture of a spreadsheet of tax assessment data from the city of Boston. It's a really boring spreadsheet, right? I'll be honest with you. That's a boring picture for me to be putting on a slide. I'm probably breaking all sorts of presentation rules right now by putting that up there. But on the other hand, it is a detailed record of every parcel in the city of Boston. It is a detailed coverage of the entire landscape. And I only have about six columns here. There's something like a hundred columns in the data. It tells you when everything was built, how long it's been there, how much it's worth, how much land it's on, um, how many chimneys, bathrooms, bedrooms it has, right? It tells you so much about the landscape of the city. And this is one data set that every municipality has. A municipality like Lexington has the same exact data set um, sitting on a server, and it's just one of many data sets that every municipality is collecting at this point in time because they have to, right? Think about building permits, education data, traffic data, police data, right? All of these things that Lexington, like any other municipality, is collecting and really gives us an insight into the pulse of the community, right? The pulse of um, Lexington itself and what is happening there on a day-to-day -day basis, on a monthly basis, on a yearly basis, so on and so forth. Um, and you can really start to represent that through visual analytics, through um, various types of studies, and it doesn't need to be um, these sort of wild and crazy big data um, explorations to be able to answer the questions that are important to Lexington and are contained within its data, it just takes some creativity and some, and some leveraging of that content. So my argument really here is that, right, this approach uh, is, has a vast array of applications. Um, it can be applied to anything that you're collecting data for and every agency is collecting data. Um, and therefore it's accessible to all cities and institutions or at least more so, right? It's one thing to consider a six, seven, eight figure um, infrastructure bid to put in um, sensors on every street corner. It's another thing to get a co-op from Northeastern um, or an intern or a, a class. Uh, I know Lexington has, has worked with uh, classes before um, on, on project-based learning, as, as the superintendent mentioned, um, but at the university level, um, to dig into some data just try to find something out and to, and to get some momentum going. Um, and so that's a much lower ask than, than some of the sort of way out in the future visions of smart cities that leave us kind of paralyzed um, and without action. Um, and then with that, the future is now. Uh, you can do it now. You can do it tomorrow, right? Um, a university like Northeastern, or I know BU, um, the Boston Area Research Initiative, which I direct, we, we work with um, we have six different universities represented on our board, um, and there are faculty and centers at all of those universities that are looking for ways to collaborate with municipalities um, and to help them figure out how to use their data um, and technology and other things in ways that can benefit the local populace. And I think that the current moment is only going to increase that tendency, that desire among academics and their students. Um, and, and so, with that, I, you know, we can still work on the futuristic tech in the meantime. We'll get there uh, eventually, uh, and that's happening. The people are testing that. Uh, I'm not entirely certain what the venture capital situation on that is going to look like in seven months, but in theory, um, had I been giving this talk three years ago, I would say, you know, that's there's billions of dollars there. It's ongoing, um, and we'll see we'll see what happens now. Um, how much of a stall that takes, but um, so that's why I. I take this term smart cities um, and, and I kind of, uh, I want to throw it out. I don't love it um, because it has all these trappings of being sort of a 1960s movie version of what 2040 could look like. Um, and instead, 
Uh, I use this term, urban informatics. Uh, it's a much less sexy term. I think that's why I like it, uh, because it is simply what it says it is. It is um, using data and technology to better understand and serve cities and communities. Uh, it's, it's, not, it's not exciting. Uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't evoke a lot of, you know, uh, you know, crazy visions and sugar plum fairies, so to speak. Um, but I'm okay with that. I, I think that's that's okay because that's not what we want to be doing. We we really just want to be supporting communities and enabling them to feel like they are all part of the conversation and and that it doesn't need to be something that's far off and isolated in the cities. Um, so so that's kind of my spiel uh, on on smart cities and urban informatics and where I see um, you know where I see municipalities that are not metropolises falling into this. Uh, where I promised I would double back was the COVID-19 um, aspect of things. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll give my, my personal take on that. Uh, and, and Jay, you know, definitely draw me out more if, if I'm seeming to miss some angle. But I think I think just like each of the panelists before me, right, the imperative is even greater right now. Right. And, and it's funny, I had this conversation um, a couple weeks ago with one of my colleagues in the city of Boston, who, with whom I've worked for a long time. Uh, he he um, leads the mayor's office of New Urban Mechanics. It's kind of the innovation or they call themselves the R&D team for the city of Boston. Uh, and they, they do a lot of thinking about how you can innovate in city services. And I, I asked him as we were all sort of, I think, scrambling as Dr. Hackett uh, pointed out so sort of um, viscerally, right? Uh, we're, I think we all have been scrambling the last few weeks to try to figure out, okay, well, what happened to my industry just now, right? Where, where are we going? What, what are we supposed to be doing? And how do, we, how do we do what we do in a way that helps everybody? And, and I asked them, did it just end, right? Did we, did we just lose it all, right? Everything we've built over the last 10 years, um, is it gone? Because the only thing anyone is worried about right now is infectious disease uh, and um, and, you know, getting out of this uh, and figuring out how to get two weeks worth of food in your house just in case you get quarantined, right? Um, and, you know, we talked for a little while and we kind of worked it through and we came to the conclusion that no, no, what we've been doing and, and what people in this space are doing right now is even more important and imperative because we just blew everything up. Right. By shutting down society, we have revealed, we have exacerbated, we have created vulnerabilities, inequities in all of our systems and communities are systems of systems. Right. Whether it be, you know, education, as, as the superintendent pointed out, or labor, as um, Dr. Baravesh pointed out, or public transit and transportation or mental health. Right. Everyone on this call has been in their house for three weeks um, and, and is probably getting a little stir crazy, right? And, and there are a lot of people out there who need the mental health system right now more than ever. Um, social services, how are basic city services operating? And what are, the, what are the issues that came up in this whole process? Some of which we knew were there, but we thought were just fine. And others of which we didn't even know were there. Um, and so, and, and what places do we have inequalities in society, inequities? Um, where we suddenly have to be very, um, th they're suddenly very acute. You know, um, there was an editorial this morning in the Globe about mortgage and rent relief. Um, and while that's a, a right now solution, how do we think about the precariousness of some of our systems when we come out of this? And, and so I think that the best way to understand that, and, and this is the, the perspective of an academic, but I, I would think many people in the, the virtual room would agree, is data, right? Data tells us what happened. Data tells us what is happening and data tells us what will happen. Um, and, and using data effectively to tell a story is the best tool you can give a policymaker, is the best tool you can give a practitioner because it gives them guidance as to how to support the communities that they serve. Um, and so I think that this is a conversation um, and the use of data and technology to really um, support our recovery as a society, not just the economic recovery, but our recovery in every other domain is going to be critical. Uh, and, and it's something that uh, is going to become more and more salient in uh, the coming weeks and the coming months. Uh, and so, right, I mean, smart cities, smart cities just became right now, as opposed to something far away and, and uh, a luxury or a figment um, that's somewhere out there. Uh, I, I think it just became what we have to do today. Uh, and tomorrow 
as we as we get our acts together and we, we figure out where we're going next. And I, I realized that we were supposed to be talking about 2040 at this point. Um, I think the way we redesign our systems in the next year is going to redefine where we are in 20 years. And to be honest, I don't think we can predict where we are in 20 years until we, we get to the end of this, what's gonna be a vastly transformative period. Great, thank you, Dan. Um, I wanna uh, go back to some of the questions that have come across as we've been listening to these three really wonderful, thoughtful folks who helped set the table for us. Uh, one of the questions is what permanent impact will COVID-19 leave in its tracks? And a related question is, where else do you see, this is beyond the uh, Dr. Uh, Hackett's uh, thoughts on where the school system might be changed. Where else do you see similar opportunities to reshape and perhaps improve Lexington's future? So let's think about that all, all four of us uh, for a few minutes. Before we do, a question that reflects back again on something Dr. Hackett said earlier on, which is that as a species, we don't relish change. Uh, Mark Twain has this great line, I'm all for progress, it's change I can't stand. Uh, as, as you just said, Dr. O'Brien, we've just sort of blown up a lot of our systems. Um, uh, even if we were willing, uh, unwilling to see some of the divides and some of the challenges before, they have now been made even more manifest. How do, we, how do we as a species and as a community, specifically in Lexington, support one another to learn to be less uncomfortable with these imponderables, the uh, incomplete information, the uncertainty, and the fact that we know that business as usual is, is not working, but we don't know what's next. What, what kind of conversation should we as a community be having to get us through this period so that we don't all get depressed? Any thoughts? Well, I'll start. I mean, it's, it, you know, a couple of obvious things. One is that the whole definition of community has changed. Uh, we are now a digital community. Um, it's not to say we won't go back to being, uh, you know, actual community, actual in the sense of interactive personal communities. But, but the good news is lots and lots of people reaching out to each other digitally um, and trying to stay in touch, trying to sort of boost themselves and everybody else. And uh, that's a big transformation. I think we'll probably retain parts of that, um, you know, going forward. Um, and uh, sort of on that theme, huge digital transformations in any number of industries, education, obviously, but in, in retail, as I mentioned, in entertainment. Um, and I think, again, we may go back a little bit to where, where things were before, but some of these changes are going to be permanent. So, um, so, I mean, I could keep going, but I think those are two that kind of come to mind right away. Well, keep going. Then, then I want to get, you know, Dan and Julie. No, no, no I want to give other people a chance to. to okay. This as well. Dan, Julie, what are your thoughts about how we, uh, how we manage this transition for ourselves and our neighbors? Yeah. I mean, one of the things I've been thinking a lot about uh, is, you know, Narawan, uh, or Dr. Baravesh was talking a little bit earlier about this distinction between a V and a U-shaped, right, uh, recession. Um, and, you know, it's funny, this, this event is so unprecedented um, in the sense that, right, the, so if we go back to the 30s, we go back to the depression, and I'm not actually an economist, so Dr. Baravesh may, may just correct some of my logic here, but my sense of what happened there was it was an actual collapse of the economic system, right? There was a bubble that burst and the whole economic system realized it had no clothes, um, and so it fell apart. Um, and so it, it, the economic system was itself exposed, and therefore it takes a lot of time to rebuild that because there's nothing to rebuild upon. Whereas this was a fascinating event to me, I hate to use the word fascinating, but fascinating because, you know, had this been shorter, it would have been a pure V, right? We shut down, but all the infrastructure is still there. So you just open the doors back up, right? It, it's like a snow day, as, as Dr. Hackett said, but it's not just a snow day. And, and it's funny, instead of, I guess one, another metaphor for it is, right, suffocation rather than um, heart attack, right? So we're experiencing suffocation as an economy right now. And the question is, will we start breathing before the whole body shuts down? You know, um, and, and so then, 
but we can, I think, extend that metaphor to any other system, right? Where are we just going to bounce back? And where did something get changed fundamentally? Um, I noticed one of the questions in the Q&A that I found really interesting was about, um, you know, small businesses in Lexington and how, you know, there's literally zero revenue coming in right now. Um, how long do they weather that storm, right? Which is different from a recession like 2008, 2009, where there's just less capital, but at least there's something coming in, right? There's a way to, um, there, there's a way potentially to manage the system um, and pull back, but stay up. Um, and so I, I wonder about the same thing for everything else we're doing, right? And and depending on how long we stay in a certain form of interaction, right? The point about digital interaction, how much do we just get comfortable with Zoom, right? Um, you know, and so a lot of my academic colleagues have been joking to people who are turning conferences into online conferences, you know, don't do it too well. We still want to be allowed to go to Europe, right? <laughs> we still want to be allowed to travel. Um, and so there's these questions, some of them good and some of them bad, where we could develop habits now. Um, Another one that we, we were looking at some data yesterday, and please do not quote me on this, but I will share it with you anyway, because we haven't confirmed it, but there's some, some evidence beginning to crop up that people who would otherwise ride subways right now because they have to get to work, but have to go somewhere, are choosing to ride the bus because subways are, 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 big, are, are big metal death cars underground. You can't get away from the crowd, but the bus you can. And so right now, now, whether that's a real finding or not, that's an example of the way people may change their behaviors. And if those behaviors stick, then we have to figure out how to accommodate that, right? We have to figure out how to restructure to attend to those shifts. And those shifts are occurring everywhere. Um, and, and so it's this question of the V versus the U, right? To what extent do we just bounce right back to where we were versus did the underlying patterns change, the underlying tendencies change? Jay, uh, I know Julie hasn't had her turn yet, but at some point, either before or after she talks, I'd like to get back to the economics and some of the issues that Dan raised, very good issues that Dan raised about the economics. I don't know how you want to do it. Do you want to go to Julie first? Yeah, let's, Julie, yeah why, don't we, why don't we do that, Julie, some thoughts just about the psychology of the moment and the, how, we, how we manage to retain the enthusiasm that you obviously have for the uh, working in this unknown and, and inventing a new, which is, that is seizing the moment. And I uh, absolutely hope we do that in a whole host of domains. But that requires sort of managing our fear and our discomfort with change. So your thoughts about how to do that, you've, you've had to do that over the last weeks. And in terms of how do we um, retain anything good that's come out of this experience, I, I think what we could um, consider as a community, it, is thinking about building in time for reflection. Our brains are trained to focus on ne negative things. And I think there's an equation out there that says that we do that about 80% of the time and about 20% of the time we let ourselves think positive thoughts. So we're constantly inundating our own minds with worries and concerns and criticisms and critiques. Um, and if we could as a community say, you know what, right now is a perfect time to think about what we've been through and what's worked about it and what we wanna preserve moving forward. I think that could be incredibly powerful. So I was listening to Dan's remarks and Dan, you said something like, what do people of Lexington need right now and how can we use data and how can we think about solving these problems in a way that will move the town forward? Well, what we need in Lexington right now it's, you know, there, are, there are many opinions about it, but I, I know one for sure is a better um, transportation model so that fewer um, automobiles are on the road, fewer buses or just less traffic congestion. And so I was thinking about what we're doing now in terms of remote learning and wondering to myself, oh, if we were to apply what we're doing right now to try to solve that problem as a community, um, could we say one day a week somebody teaches from home and then our students who never have the opportunity to do um, remote learning in a virtual sense, perhaps they would take one class before they graduate in that kind of platform and, and certainly definitely um, 
encouraging them. I didn't say this before, but I had it in my notes around um, data analytics and, and knowing how to um, use the information in order to create a new literacy. Uh, but I think if, if we're paying attention and we're smart and thoughtful in Lexington, we can take a horrible experience and um, come out better for it. Great. Uh, Naraman, you want to uh, jump in here and then we'll come back to this. Yeah, that, Dan raised a very good question about the Great Depression. And, and I think I use that as a segue to talk about the importance of policy. We really haven't talked much about that. And it's, it's very relevant to a lot of the stuff that we're saying right now. What happened in the Great Depression was absolutely there was a, you know, a, a bubble burst. But the big, big problem with the Great Depression was that for a long period of time, the Federal Reserve, our central bank, did nothing. Basically, they sat and, and watched. And it, in the process, it actually ended up tightening, de facto tightening monetary policy um, and worsened the recession. So what could have been a you know, garden variety recession turned into a very deep downturn. In 2008, 2009, the person who's chair of the Federal Reserve, Ben Bernanke, had written a dissertation about the Great Depression and the mistakes of the Federal Reserve at MIT. And he said very clearly, we're not going to make that same mistake again. And they didn't. They moved very aggressively, very fast. And so we had a recession, but it wasn't Great Depression 2.0. The Fed's doing similar things this time in very, very unorthodox ways. But I'll give you a couple of specifics. For example, it is starting to, normally the Fed, when it conducts various kinds of liquidity operations, it buys government bonds and mortgage-backed securities to protect the housing market. Now it's buying municipal bonds, it's buying corporate bonds, and it's about to buy uh, uh, the debt of small businesses. This is huge. I mean, we've never done this before. So from that perspective, this is big, and the Fed is doing, from my perspective, a lot of the right things, but we need more than that. We need the fiscal element. And as I said earlier, you know, we've had elements of it, parts of it, but we haven't had enough. And I think you know, Congress certainly understands that. I think the president understands that. Although they're starting to talk about the tax cut of 2017. And my feeling is don't waste a lot of time on that. You know, give a lot of help to small businesses. That's where the problem is. That's the ground zero. And I think there's a question about that and Dan talked about it. That's the ground zero here and we need to deal with it. Great. Um, what comes to mind is a comment made by a colleague of mine, Bob Keegan, yesterday, who said that unlike any other crisis that we have, uh, that we can think of here, there's no enemy who is another human being or another country or another race or whatever of the sort. This is, uh, we are all in this one together. Uh, and that opens up the possibility of a community, a sense of community yeah. um, that may, um, may if, if we're wise in how we uh, use that, uh, give us some possibility for getting through this together. Not just getting through this together, but uh, again, what comes to mind is the word survive, um, which we take to mean just getting by, actually derives from the French, which survivre, which is living beyond, living above, going beyond. So maybe the survival that, we, that will be told of our generation is uh, more, than just, more than just getting by. That would certainly be my hope. Um, a number of you have mentioned some of the sort of underlying challenges that are facing us uh, in this country and in the world more generally, but in this country and certainly in, in Lexington, the economic divide. You know, wealth and income is a huge factor uh, in Lexington as in uh, the rest of the country. Uh, the opportunity divide, whether it's be you know, access to digital media or not, but the, op the opportunities that some people have are way beyond what other people have. Uh, Dr. Hackett certainly mentioned the fact that the education system has been awaiting uh, a major revisit uh, for, a, for generations. And we're still rooted in an agricultural calendar and in a factory model that uh, maybe, just maybe, uh, we can revisit um, at this time. How we, certainly our healthcare system, all the cracks in that are abundantly obvious. So we have to think about how we reinvent the way we deliver healthcare and what even healthcare means. 
and our political system. The flaws of that are abundantly obvious. I was thinking about your comment, Dan, about relying on data. Um, one person's data is another person's alt fact, uh, alt reality in, in this political environment. And that's toxic, absolutely toxic. And uh, I don't know how democracy survives um, in an era in an era in an era where there are those kinds of divides. So maybe, just maybe, in this moment, there's an opportunity for us to come together around a common challenge, a common opportunity, and leave some of these very disruptive and very disquieting, huge challenges on the table long enough to start grappling with them. I think, Julia, a question came across about the extent to which you are, well, the extent to which really we all are tapping into some of the great expertise in Lexington. I mean, there are a lot of very smart, very engaged people in this community, um, working in different arenas to be sure, but I bet this Lexington Futures Committee could convene a bunch of working groups on some of the areas that we have just mentioned here tonight and, and undoubtedly others. And I would love to see that come out of this conversation, but let me shut up and see what thoughts that might have provoked. Or, um, I'm thinking about the utilization of the experts in our community on the decision to close schools. Um, so we had people with firsthand knowledge of what happened in Wuhan in the community talking about you don't understand quite what's to come unless you've experienced it in the way that we have in a personal sense. You've lost family members, loved ones. Um, so we did a lot of listening to um, those people, listening to researchers whose job it is to, to uh, trace viruses like this and epidemiologists, virologists, um, lots of people in the community who um, I think we're so fortunate that we have uh, the ability to have access to those types of data so quickly um, and we can make decisions as a result. And meanwhile, it generally takes a lot longer and it gets filtered through bureaucratic systems and uh, that impacts obviously the decisions that we can make to keep ourselves healthy. But um, I think a very tangible and concrete example is we had a school committee meeting People came to talk, they shared their personal stories about COVID-19. Um, people had been sharing them all along in the weeks prior. Um, and it was very early on in the discussion, no schools had closed yet at all. And there was no talk of closing of schools. Um, so I reflected on that and reflected on the information that I'd been hearing and learning, reached out to some colleagues in um, area school systems first reached out to the Board of Health and the town who've been great in collaborating through this and just said, you know, I'm, I'm thinking that we could do a two week school closure, but I don't know if the time is right right now. Um, can you help me figure out what the window would be and when the right time would be? And if you can, then I can help make that decision to close schools. And so Board of Health reached out to epidemiologists, virologists, they weighed in saw the science behind what we're dealing with and how to flatten the curve. And um, when we got the answer that, yeah, the time is right right now and um, people hadn't made that decision at the state level, um, we mobilized, contacted some other school systems and were able to um, start the school closure um, well ahead of the, the governor's decision. And so tapping into that level of expertise in a community like ours is a gift and uh, we're really grateful to be able to use the experts in any way that they are willing to work with us. And also just as a school system in general, um, one thing that we haven't done a great job in the past with, as I hear from community members and educators is kind of letting people through our doors. Uh, we have so many experts that finding ways to bring them in and engage them can be challenging because we have all those uh, structures in place like I talked about at the beginning of this conversation the five day you know five classes that get ta taught 25 kids in each class people move from bell to bell um, so how do you utilize this great creative genius that's in the community and 
we're trying to get better at that and create flexible structures so that we can partner with the community in um, bigger and better ways. And this period of time during remote learning has been fantastic for that because we've been able to um, have people send resources on, you know, here's something you could teach on the virus or here's something to teach um, while kids are doing more creative things. All the things that we never could get to with the traditional structure, we're finding ways to do that now. And I, I find that incredibly exciting and encouraging. Let me stick with you for a second, if I might. There have been a couple of questions that I want to put uh, out to you. Uh, when would Lexington introduce digital teachers? And then does the ex existing data support that one online class per student or a teacher would cut busy traffic? Um, I think I heard you put out both of those as among the many ideas that are on the table right now and that uh, you just want as many questions on the table right now before you worry about answers. Is that fair? Well, yes. Let me clarify the one class. That was not what I was suggesting would deal with the traffic. I'm suggesting that if an organization as large as we are with 1,400 employees um, was to make the decision to allow um, people to work from home, uh, what would be the benefit? And I'm, I'm not saying all the time, but I'm saying it might be interesting to say, okay, you know, we can pick a day of the week when a certain teacher is able to do this and we can figure out the logistics of it. But if we were to do that and the town were to do that, um, would there be some way to solve our transportation problem and free up the traffic and congestion? I also said that you could probably also um, build new systems like having students graduate with one uh, online learning type course. Um, so two related ideas, but kind of separate in terms of what I was sharing. And then you asked me something else. No, I think as I hear you, uh, you are exhibiting your mission statement, uh, joy in learning, curiosity in life and compassion in all we do. You are um, curious and learning and enjoying the yeah. learning. I'm joyful most of the time. Right. Well, I think that all of us, you know, spoke to some sense of the opportunities of the moment. And um, I think that's, that's the right place to be um, without ignoring the fact that the journey is a difficult one for, for all of us uh, and for some even more than for others. And I think, uh, Dr. Hackett, you spoke about how to provide learning opportunities for kids who either don't have traditional learning styles or have needs of one sort or another. What about the fact that the schools have become the meal ticket for a lot of kids? You know, the only good meal they get during the day is in school and they're not getting that meal now. So, um, Do that you want me to, to respond? Oh. Well, I'm just thinking that, yes, yeah. I would love you to respond, but I'm just thinking this is again, uh, revealed some of the, some of the serious fault lines that we need to look at. But please do respond. Just a quick response to that. Um, we, that was one of the big challenges we faced, how to get technology into everyone's hands. It was not a problem for um, our older, you know, middle school through high school kids because they had a device, but we didn't have that system in place for our elementary school students. And we made sure that we got a device to everyone while at the same time we were supposed to be social distancing. So there's a bit of a dilemma, same with lunches um, and breakfasts. And we ended up um, being innovative, borrowing ideas from others as well, and um, creating grab and go systems for breakfast and lunch and for technology where people um, would drive up, pop their trunk open, put a sign up that said a name of a kid and in pops the tech or in pops the lunch and away they go. And so we maintain social distancing. We were able to meet our obligation to make sure everybody who needed a meal got one or everybody who needed technology got one. We even, this is a funny story. Uh, we even got um, requests from um, some families in neighboring dis districts who were wondering how they got their tech from, from us. And we had to kind of explain that this is a Lexington thing. And, you know, we, we we'll share always, but, um, what it told us was that the word was out and you know people understood that we were taking care of that need. We also have Lexington public school students who live in Boston. And so making sure that we got the technology to them and making sure that they had meals if they needed them um, was also something that 
that we've thought about. And in this remote learning environment, something that we've talked about for two years since I've been on uh, the team in Lexington is um, how do we bridge that divide with our Boston families? Hard to get to Boston. We do go to Boston for some school committee meetings. Um, it's hard sometimes for them to get into Lexington. Um, and we used to have a school committee member who all the time said, isn't there some kind of thing that we could do to kind of talk to the communities or include them in our, in our um, school committee meetings? So the, the thing is Zoom or some sort of um, technology like we're doing that we haven't thought about before. So I can see that being another big benefit as we move forward, perhaps with those um, communities who, for whom it's a little bit harder to connect. Norman, Dan, do you want to weigh in or should I go to another question? No, I'd, I'd love to, yeah, I'd love to share, I guess, two thoughts. Um, to your point about <coughs> can we kind of capitalize on, on sort of community spirit at this point? And um, I'm going to give two thoughts. One is, one is very much in my own sort of wheelhouse of innovation session. The other one's a little different, um, but um, more on the sociological side of what I do. Uh, but um, you know, kind of the Dr. Hackett's point about can we take a moment to reflect, I wonder if similarly we as communities can take a moment to permit innovation um, and experimentation because uh, I, I deeply admire my, my colleagues in the public sector um, and, and a lot of times don't envy them because someone is always looking to scrutinize what they're doing, right? And you know, I will admit, as, as a parent of young children in Arlington Public Schools, I've definitely looked at these emails that we get from the district and sat and grumbled and because I have my own opinion, right? As Dr. Haggis said, every, every parent has their own opinion. And, and heck, those of us who also teach, we're the worst, right? Because we have all sorts of opinions about uh, how teaching should occur. Um, and, and, you know, you, you try to either just keep your mouth shut and recognize that you have too many opinions um, or be polite if you want to communicate something, although not everyone does that. Uh, but I guess the point I'm trying to make is that whether it's education, whether it's transit, whether it's the permitting department, whether it's, you know, sanitation, someone's got an opinion, right? And if you innovate, someone's going to not like it, right? And someone's going to really like it. Some, some innovation, some new ideas are going to make lots of people happy, but you're likely to get someone to show up at that town meeting, at that school committee meeting, who raises their hand and very loudly announces why they didn't like it. Um, and, and that's one of the challenges of being a public servant, and public servants have taken that upon themselves, but I think what it also does is it creates an environment a lot of times where then risk-taking, where innovation, where experimentation is discouraged, you know. It's, um, you know, when I first got into this line of work, one of my mentors told me it is, it is an inherently risk averse job, right? Because that's how you get through. And I wonder if we have a window here to, to play, right? And, and I think a lot of people have seen this, like I've seen the goodwill on behalf of my, on the sense of my students, right? As I move my in-person course, that was an experiential seminar where we were doing a research project together to an online course. And, you know, I've, I've felt them be very sort of like, okay, we're along for the ride here. Try some stuff. Let's see if it works. Let's keep in communication and we'll do it. Um, and, you know, seeing that with all sorts of things across the university, across domains. And I wonder if we can keep that spirit going for a little while where we, we experiment with and innovate upon the things that we do and see if we can do something better. And if not, we call it a pilot and we throw it out, right? Um, but we, we don't operate as, as policymakers and as those who, who collaborate with and support policymakers, we don't operate from a sense of fear of, um, well, what is, what is the one thing about this that's going to really upset somebody, right, and, and set somebody off and then prevent us from trying something new. Uh, and, and so I hope I hope that there's an opportunity here to, to kind of turn lemonade, uh, sorry, I've been flipping that one all week, turn lemons into lemonade um, in, in that spirit. Um, I think the other one is, so it's funny, um, I, as I said before, I, I often study Boston, right, and, and collaborate with policymakers in Boston. I collaborate with policymakers in other municipalities as well, but, you know, the, the difference between people who live in Beacon Hill and the people who live in Lower Roxbury, right, for example, 
is pretty it's a pretty big chasm, right, economically speaking, um, which is that same chasm is not necessarily present in Lexington, but there are still inequalities, right? There's still variation. Um, and, and I think, though, what's going to be really interesting to watch, and I think, to, I think it's up to policymakers and, and, and public leaders to really communicate this to people, that depending on one's industry, this is going to hit people differently, right? There are people who have been very successful, and, and, you know, same, so two people, same socioeconomic status coming into this crisis, depending on their industry, someone who has done great owning a small business might really be struggling right now. Might be, as Dr., uh, as Naraman mentioned, um, you know, starting to rack up debt because there's no income coming in, whereas there are some other industries which are a little bit more recession-proof, at least for a while, right? Um, because the money remains there, the institution remains stable. Um, and so I think, you know, an awareness on the part of, of Lexingtonians that there are, there, there might be a new dimension of inequality within the, the community that's occurring right now and to be mindful of that and, and supportive of neighbors um, as they're facing these challenges in different ways uh, and, and, and the different challenges it produces for people. Um, and, and I think that falls along a number of different lines, right? Industries, right? Whose life is upturned more by a quarantine or this kind of semi-quarantine society versus others, you know, all those sorts of things that weren't apparent three weeks ago. So there's a number of you raised okay. issues okay. about, okay. yeah, yeah just, go ahead, that I've thought. I, mean, I think you and Dan have raised this issue of inequality. There's no question that this disease is hitting poor people harder than richer people, not so much in the, in the sense of the spread of the disease, but in their, in their financial ability and their access to medicine and so forth. Uh, so it's huge. And same thing in, the, in terms of big businesses and small businesses. We keep coming back to small businesses, but the local barber doesn't have access to capital markets in the same way that DuPont does. I, mean, I don't mean to pick on DuPont, but, but the point is that, and I think it is absolutely crucial as individuals, as charities, as as uh, churches, as however we want to sort of articulate, as the government, local government, state government, national government, to help uh, you know, the, the people who are gonna be hurt more differentially than others. So, I, I mean, I think that's, that's a big, big challenge here. So I'm just struck, uh, I, I think a lot about what's the nature of leadership that's required for these uncertain times. And, um, I just absolutely loved the mission statement for the schools because this could just as easily be a mission statement for public sector leadership. Joy and learning, curiosity in life and compassion in all we do. Just imagine if, you know, back to Dan's point before, just imagine if our elected officials were willing to say, I don't know the answers. I'm not, not even sure we know what the questions are. Let's sit around and figure that out. That's a very different style of leadership than we're used to. Um, and absolutely imperative for these kind of uncertain times. Uh, there's a question in here about what are the losses that are being suffered as we go through all these changes. And one of the losses that we're gonna suffer if we allow our leaders to not know is they're not gonna, you know, the emperor is gonna have no, you know the old story about the emperor having no clothes. We were afraid as a community to admit the emperor has no clothes because if he has no clothes then we're naked. You know, who's gonna protect us? And if we don't have all the answers, we've got to model uh, our comfort and our excitement about not having all the answers and, and our willingness to experiment and admit that we, we went wrong. That's a very different style of leadership in general and certainly public sector leadership. So I wanna uh, pivot a little bit back to the, uh, us as a community. Um, there's a question about what should this futures committee be looking at? What are the questions that the Futures Committee should be putting on the table right now. Back to your framing earlier, Dan. So what are the questions as we think about um, I, not so much the moment of transition, but where we wanna be on the other side? Uh, my answer is really short, right? Uh, you, don't, you don't have those questions yet, right? I don't think we have those questions for 10 months, for a year. Um, because... I've got a few. Okay. Well, I mean, maybe I, I think almost the questions that are the questions that are forefront are the questions that are going to beg more questions, right? Just because I think we need to know where everything landed. 
Um, I mean, I think there are definitely immediate questions. Uh, so if I'm if I'm the town manager, right, that I want to answer. But if I'm thinking 20 years out, I, I really have a hard time thinking about what does the pathway up the mountain even look like because I don't even I don't even know where we are, right? Um, so that, that's kind of my my sense. But I think the pathway right now is to keep you know you know keep working with the leaders who have their finger on the pulse. So the Dr. Hackett's of the world, right, um, who are leading the main institutions, um, who can then tell you what questions are coming up. And then sort of the kaleidoscope will start to come into, I think, um, it will start to become more focused uh, over the next nine months to a year, give or take. That, that's my sense. Hey, Jeff, yeah, I, yeah, yeah, what would you, what would you yeah. yes, please. I, I think it's easy to get mesmerized by this event we're going through and lose track of the big picture and the important priorities. And to me, those really haven't changed in the last 20 years for a town like Lexington. Number one, invest in education, big time. This is, this is one of the hallmarks, one of the strengths of this community. And we, we've done okay, but we've not done anywhere near enough, is the way I would say it. Another one is invest in affordable housing. It's a big, big issue for this town. Um, you know, the, the, the story is, and it's still true, that people who work for this town can't live in this town. That's a terrible indictment. We, we, need, we need to change that. So to me, those two things haven't really changed for the next 10 years, 20 years. So we've got to keep, we've got to keep our eye on the ball here, even though we're struggling in our personal lives in terms of the economy. We just can't lose sight of those things. Great. Now, there, there are a couple of challenges for the Futures Committee. Others that anybody wants to put on the table? I think you, you certainly touched on the ones that, are, that keep me up at night. Um, the wealth and income inequality, the opportunity of inequality in the community as well as in the society as a whole. Um, a public education system, again, that begs for to be reinvented. Healthcare is a little tougher to deal with at the community level, but clearly is, uh, needs to be on the national agenda. And then there was a specific question about online voting um, in, in terms of getting through this, this next couple of months. But I want to broaden that question into what kinds of questions the uh, this Lexington Futures Committee ought to be looking at in the way we govern ourselves. And again, we're just a subset of a state and a subset of a nation, but what should we be thinking about how we govern ourselves? How should we re reinvent governance? A big question. Yeah. Yes. I mean, that's I, 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 a huge I'm, question. I'm content, I'm content to put, you know, if we can come up with a good list of questions for the Lexington Futures yeah. Committee, then we've done our job. <laughs> then we can pretend to have some answers or or just by example, um, exhibit some discomfort, exhibit some comfort with not knowing. Yeah. I think the way you framed it, Jay, was, was perfect. I mean, if you can, as a leader, become more comfortable with the unknown and the risk taking that was mentioned and be willing to put yourself out there and understand that if you try something um, and we have a collection of leaders who believe this, that if you try something and, and it is a failure, it's okay. People will, will be okay. And then we can um, take another approach that, that makes sense. Being strategic about what those decisions are is important because people um, can't tolerate too much change too fast. Um, so you know, pacing is important. But bringing together um, leaders and futures uh, committee and you know, anyone who is interested in moving the town forward to have those kinds of discussions, I think, would be um, very powerful. I like the idea of um, making space for conversation about innovation. I like the idea still of reflection. I, I do think that's important because you can't go forward until you've taken the time to kind of work through uh, and process where you are now, in my opinion. Um, and I do... Um, agree with Dr. Baravesh um, on many points, all points actually, um, but the, of course, support for, for education, I'm all for that. <laughs> and um, the public housing issue is big, transportation is big, um, and structuring conversations where we cannot have them be aimed at um, 
just a litany of complaints. Um, not that that happens everywhere. So it's not, you know, a Lexington thing, but it's how our brains work. As I said before, if we could structure a forward thinking conversation where maybe you're not supposed to, you know, one of the ground rules would be you're not supposed to say a negative. You have to, you know, think about the positive and how would you move that forward and turn the negative question into, you know, something positive and some expression of positivity. Um, we could get a lot of synergy and traction around ideas and build a plan that um, we all can participate in and have a focus around ideas for every bit of our organization, um, or, or of the organizations in town. So common goals, you know, how can schools help with public housing? How can I help with transportation in my role as a leader? Um, and I know these conversations are happening a bit in siloed ways already, uh, but if we wanna mobilize around a few key ideas, like Dr. Baravesh was talking about, um, we, could, we could be in a much better place. And we're gonna have to do that um, to your point about the economy and what's ahead of us, if we're going to be able to um, continue to be the great place that Lexington is. And what comes to mind, Dr. Um, Daniel Borston, the historian and author of the, among other books, The Discoverers, has a wonderful line in there. He defines, I can't remember whether it's mistakes or failures, but it makes no difference. Um, mistakes or failures are the portals of discovery. Um, almost all scientific advances have happened because somebody made a mistake somewhere along the way and it was an interesting mistake. And uh, there are companies that reward, give a cash award to the person on the staff who came up with the best idea that failed to encourage innovation um, and say that risk-taking is part of, it, it's, it is inherent in growth and change. On the subject of what, you know, how the schools might be thinking about reinventing themselves, you have um, curiosity in life um, as one of, you know, a central part of your mission statement. I interpret that to include lifelong learning and leaving whatever we call schooling uh, with that um, lifelong curiosity. Uh, one of the questions is how do we deal with the senior demographic in this town, a large demographic? And I'm wondering to what extent um, you might have thought about how the schools might serve that constituency as well. The intergenerational connections are key um, for all members of a community and especially for our students. Um, so staying closely connected with um, Town Celebrations Committee, for example, I do work with them and um, we try to um, get lots of participation by our young people in the town events that are so important, Patriots Day, things like that. Um, I have also um, recently met with them to talk about the upcoming celebration um, in the fall. They're doing a, a World War II um, talk and how that impacted Lexington. So. I'll moderate that panel. And the reason I do that is because that keeps our students closely connected to all the populations in the community. So then when I know what's happening with our seniors, I can take it back to seniors being our senior citizens, I can take it back to our students in um, school and find ways to uh, connect um, and help us learn and develop the empathy and compassion and really, um, make sure that we're preserving what the people in the community have valued and, and you know, loved and the traditions and learning from them. Um, I think it's criti critically important for the young people and it does bring curiosity. If you create situations for young people and you don't have to work too hard to do it and you connect them to a human being with a real story and you say, you know, go find out about this person and you know how it was for him during World War II or her, them. Um, they they take the ball and run with it. You don't need to do a lot. And the learning that um, we never measure that is so vitally important happens in those kinds of experiences. So we have our little people at the new Lexington Children's Place. It was built close to the community center. Um, whenever we can, we truck them over to the community center so they can meet with um, our senior citizens and, and people and 
uh, you know, perform, maybe do a song, share a story. And um, those are priceless moments and we need to do a lot more of them. So there's a question that just came across that I think is addressed to me. Uh, is there an assumption in Jay's question that the town is not already being open and responsive? I think that may be true at the state and national level, but not in Lexington. So if I suggested that this community is not open and responsive, um, I, uh, I apologize. I did, that was certainly not my intention and that certainly is not my belief. I think we are extremely open. And the fact that this futures committee has been meeting consistently and has been an, an important part of the fabric of the way we make decisions is just evidence of the fact that we do things quite well here. There's always room for improvement. And I think, as we've all said, putting some of these fundamental underlying questions on the table and keeping them there and not falling back into our usual roles of being the experts with the answers, um, that's where there's even more possibility for us going forward. And I'm excited, excited about that. I love, and I'm excited about living in this community that's open to these conversations and grateful to the folks on this panel and all the questions that have come across that suggest that we are actively engaged in, in an important conversation. Before we wrap, I just want to throw it open to the three of you for any last thoughts about how you would have us be thinking about the next 20 years. Well, let me just start by essentially repeating what I said earlier is that we shouldn't lose sight of our strengths and we should continue to nurture those strengths because they're, they, they're, they make this town a very good place to be a good place to live, a town with good values. Um, but nurturing those strengths means funding them, basically. And, and we shouldn't shy away from that. I know that creates all kinds of headaches, um, cause of challenges, but we shouldn't shy away from funding those, those, those strengths that I referred to before, which is you know, clearly education, but also we, you know, we, we need to do something about affordable housing. So to me, those are top priorities that really haven't changed. And so, so I'm just repeating myself, but I, you know, it's, that's what I feel. It's worth repeating. Yeah. Good. Dan or Julie, any last words of advice for the Futures Committee? I was going to say what he said. Uh. <laughs> that's exactly right. I love that. <laughs> Keep funding um, education. It's critically important. It will be harder as we move ahead. Um, but in order to have a great school system, we need that kind of support. And um, it is that plain plain and simple as far as I'm concerned as well. And I think as a community, as we look to the next couple of decades, uh, let's, let's mobilize together. Let's figure out um, what our collective goals are and have everybody involved in them and uh, we can get more traction that way. And you may get the last word. Well, I'll keep the last word. You get the next sure. to the last word. I'll pass the last word to you. Um, I guess what I'll say is, right, if you're thinking 20 years out, and, and this is true of any town or city's master plan, you're going to get whatever you're planning wrong, right? There's no way for you to predict what the world is going to look like in 20 years. And, and so what you're really writing is an aspirational set of goals, right? And essentially defining what is it we want Lexington to be, right? And, and to look like 20 years from now. And I guess I would suggest that writing that out is a great process. It is a great process in and of itself to kind of identify goals and objectives and shared interests. But then I think the process that follows is what really matters. How do we, and, and you've hit on this, Jay, really effectively tonight. How do we structure government? How do we structure civic life and the conversations that happen therein in order to actually get there? Because if you can't innovate, if you can't progress in ways that require change, then you're not going to get there. You're going to just be pushed by the winds of the tide and whatever the market pressure does um, to the town. And so I think being mindful in that way is, is the only way you're, you're going to get to where you want to get to. Great. Well, Naraman, Dan, Julie, thank you so much for uh, seeding a very rich conversation this evening. Um, and I know you're committed to continuing this conversation. I look very much look forward to that. Meanwhile, to all of you, who participated from home, thank you for your engagement. And I guess my last words are stay engaged, stay connected, stay safe, and stay home. <laughs> Good night. Thank you, Jack. Good night. Thank Good night. you. Thank you all. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Good night.